All right. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're enjoying New Orleans so far. So, um, quick introduction. My name is Alex Pubans, and uh, I work for Microsoft Australia, so I'm actually quite happy to be in New Orleans as a bit of a tourist as well. Um, a few things about me. First of all, thank you for coming to a uh, failover clustering disaster recovery uh, session. It's quite a, quite a crowd. I'm really, really passionate about disaster recovery itself, not just about failover clustering disaster recovery, but uh, failover, um, but uh, disaster recovery in general. The reason for that is part of my job to quickly do an introduction is I'm a premier field engineer. I work um, with our premier customers across Australia mainly and New Zealand a bit. And I focus on Active Directory and clustering. So I visit them, and um, we do cluster risk assessments. Maybe some of you have come across, uh, across our cluster risk assessments. And we also do disaster recovery planning for clusters and for Active Directory. So sometimes when I ask customers uh, about their disaster recovery strategies across their failover clusters, across Active Directories, and other technologies, sometimes you identify these tiny little gaps uh, where you think that uh, with a piece of documentation and a piece of preparation, you could have avoided massive downtimes in case of a disaster. So I'm quite, quite glad that you're all here. And um, with that, I show you um, a bit of the agenda, what we're running through in the next hour or so. On Channel 9, I had a check a couple of, uh, couple of days ago. That's where you can download the recording of the session uh, in the next couple of days or so. And um, I had a couple of comments from some of you guys, maybe some of you are here, and I had the question, so can we have a look at failover clustering disaster recovery from a database perspective, from a DBA perspective, from an exchange perspective, and all these things? Now, I take a bit of a different approach in this case. We'll look at, uh, today we'll look at failover clustering as the platform. So it doesn't really matter what's running within your cluster. There are lots of common disaster scenarios that ideally you prepare for. Um, and document that we'll talk about today. So on the agenda, um, I guess most of you know what a cluster is, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be in a disaster recovery session. So we'll um, spend about a minute or you know, 30 seconds looking at the cluster definition and benefits and all these things. And then I've seen many sessions, and we've done lots and lots of presentations over the last tech heads and other shows, uh, demos, um, where we had a look at multi-site clusters. So uh, some people call them stretch clusters, geo clusters. Anyone running here geo clusters, stretch clusters, multi clusters? Yeah, so there are quite a few. Um, we've got some, some big customers over in Australia. They've uh, set up stretch clusters and, um, as part of the disaster recovery strategy. So we can have a look at how that protects you and ensures that uh, you have a continuous business with your cluster. And we also highlight a couple of things where multi-cluster doesn't help you at all. And that's the stuff I want to focus on, right? So uh, don't feel safe just because you have a stretch cluster and geo cluster across multiple, and multiple uh, locations. So we'll have a look at that. And uh, then we have something, uh, a look at something called the Paxos tag. This is where we dig a bit deeper and have a look at how cluster replication works, how we um, replicate configuration changes. And since this is a DR session, the Paxos tag is a great way to identify if your backup tools work. So if you want to do an authoritative restore of your cluster, and how do you check if it actually worked, right? So not just uh, our products, but also third-party uh, backup tools that tie into the backup API. So we have a look at the Paxos tag. Um, and then I have uh, two bigger demos. We look a bit at DPM, Data Protection Manager, and System Center 2012. We see how that helps us with the bare metal recovery of a complete cluster failure. So hopefully no one has to go through that ever, where you lose the whole cluster and you need to recover the whole thing from, from backup. So we'll have a look at how quick that is done. And then the other one, which is more likely in my opinion, is we have a look at the authoritative restore. Let's say someone goes into your cluster failover cluster management console, right clicks all your resources and hits the delete button, gets one pop-up saying, do you really want to delete it? Yep. And all of a sudden everything disappears. Right. So we want to have a look at that as well and how easy it is to, uh, to recover from backup. A couple of other components that we need. Since 2008, uh, we changed the way we authenticate in a cluster so we don't have a cluster service account anymore. And 2008, 2008, R2, 2012, uh, they work uh, fairly similar in that perspective. We have a cluster name object sitting in Active Directory. So we'll have a look at what happens when it fails what happens when it's gone, what happens if someone accident, uh, accidentally deletes the object in Active Directory. 
And um, then we'll have a look at a common or not so common, depending uh, on your environment, replacing a shared disk. Uh, now, this could be a felt disk. It could also be a working disk that you simply want to replace for all sorts of, uh, sorts of reasons. We have a look at the inbuilt technology. So in, between 2003 and 2008, the product group had a lot of work, invested a lot of work in making all these things very, very easy. So we'll have a look at how that works. And uh, last but not least, quorum recovery. So I guess most of you are familiar um, of the cluster quorum. We added quite a few models in 2008. We changed a bit. We added something called the dynamic quorum model in 2012. So I'll have a bit look at not so much at what the quorum does, but um, how to recover the quorum if it fails. What are the different approaches, right? So that's the agenda for today. So um, as I said, this mainly um, mainly concentrates on the on the platform cluster as a platform and uh, affects everything. Uh, it could be a file print cluster, an exchange cluster, a SQL cluster, Hyper-V cluster, right? So let's have a look at the uh, cluster definition and benefits first. Um, this is fairly simple. As I said, we keep it very, very brief and short. So the idea behind a cluster, a failover cluster in, uh, in 2008, or 2012, is to eliminate the single point of failure, right? So on the diagram, you see a couple of things. You see multiple nodes. So in this case, we've got four. We've got uh, a dual fabric switches. So hopefully your heartbeat connection in the cluster, they are plugged into multiple switches and not to the same one. So we are trying all these, all these things to avoid this single point of failure to provide high availability. That's the one thing and scalability. So we can very easily add nodes um, to a cluster. If you run Hyper-V virtual machines and you want to add scale, you simply add nodes and it's very easy. Ideally, it reduces the total cost of ownership. That's, that would be a good, uh, good thing, right? And um, clustering workloads. And this is by far not any complete list, right? So, but you, you know what you guys are running in the cluster. I'm pretty sure there are lots of file, file clusters, print clusters, SQL clusters. Uh, who's running Hyper-V? Hyper-V clusters, that's great. So plenty, plenty, right? I guess that's more than half the, half the uh, room. So very interesting for you guys in case you run hundreds or thousands of virtual machines in a cluster. What happens if someone goes into con configuration and deletes everything, right? How do you protect against those things? Now, multi-site cluster. We've been talking about multi-site cluster for ages. In 2003, it was a bit of a pain to set up. There were all these dependencies of uh, you had to have the same subnet configuration for all your nodes. In 2008, that went away. We can now have um, cluster nodes in different subnets. And we improved in 2008 to 2012 a bit. And the way it works, it's fairly simple. And this is very, very high level. We uh, have two different sites. And the whole purpose of a multi-site cluster is that we protect against uh, a complete site failure. We replicate the storage, right? So you can use any partner storage replication, Hitachi, EMC, um, IBM, HP, all sorts of storage replication mechanisms. And now if a whole site fails, Ideally, we've got automatic failover, right? So in case uh, in Queensland, up in Queensland, Australia, last year, a couple of years back, we had some really massive floods where people then failed over the whole data center. Oh, sorry. Uh, the whole data center across to their, to their secondary location. Ideally, it's automatic. I've seen implementations at customers on site where they still need to, needed to uh, tweak a few things and bring up their storage, but that's the idea that you have reduced downtime. Now, the problem with this is, while this um, protects against a site loss, as I said, now there are a couple of objects that it doesn't protect against at all. And uh, this is the point when I um, onsite our customers and we revisit disaster recovery strategies, and um, I ask one question, for example, do you plan your disaster recovery? Did you plan it? Do you test it on a regular basis? And you know, a couple of times the response was, Yep, we tested it last week. We tested it last month. Everything worked just fine. And then I said, all right, so what did you test? And uh, all they tested in those scenarios was the entire site failure. So they shut down one site over a weekend and tested the entire failover, and everything went, went fine. Now, in the demo, what I'll show you in a second is what happens now when you go into failover cluster manager and you just delete all the resources. Since we replicate all the changes in our cluster, well, this replicates across all your cluster nodes, across all your clusters. It doesn't matter in which site it is. So your whole cluster, even if it's stretched, will go down. Similar to, um, to Active Directory. Now, between 2008 R2 and 2012, we've made a couple of changes to the cluster name object. 
and the way the cluster starts. So we don't have the dependency, and you probably have heard of, uh, about it. Uh, uh, we don't have the dependency to necessarily talk to a domain controller anymore during startup of a cluster, right? So uh, this is really great if you've got this DMZ where you run Hyper-V uh, virtual machines in a cluster, but um, you don't necessarily have a domain controller over there all the time. Just one of the scenarios. So we'll have a look at what happens when we delete objects in Active Directory as well. Before we move into the Paxos tag, um, I want to get a quick idea of what versions of clustering you're running. Uh, so who's running 2003, old school, 2003? So still a few. So you've got a bit left, right? Some a year, a bit less, uh, two years uh, in terms of support. 2008, 2008 clusters, quite a few. 2008 R2, that's probably all the Hyper-V guys now, right? So that's why we had massive environment. So 2012, anyone? That's great to see, 2012 clusters around. So um, massive improvements. So every time uh, I'll start talking to customers in, um, for server, for server 2012, that's a bad sign. Just went dark. And it's not coming back. All right. Yeah. I'm multitasking now. So I tested the, 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 the virtual machines office a couple of times, and uh, my good old laptop, I call it my little workhorse. It's my old one, but it has 16 gigs of RAM. Never crashed. And as soon as I entered this room and set everything up, and went away. Anyway, we'll have a few more slides, and uh, hopefully everything comes back online in a second. So, uh, where were we? 2012. So, um, quite, a, quite a few enhancements in there, and you will see in the demos. Uh, I just want to show you and highlight what's different in 2008 and, and R2 as well, even though I'm using 2012 in the, uh, in the VMs. Now, talking about the Paxos tag. There's no real difference in if you look at 2008, 2008 or 2, or 2012. Who's, uh, who's familiar with the Paxos tag? Anyone has seen it? See, that's why I figured. So most of the time when I talk about customers and we run, run workshops um, and when we talk about this, usually people only realize or have used the Paxos tag um, when they've been through a disaster recovery scenario, right? So first of all, what is it? We have a look at it in a second once my VMs are back up and running. Um, it's stored in the registry on every single cluster node in the, in the cluster hive. HP local machine cluster consists of three numbers. We have the next epoch, last epoch, and we have a sequence number. Now the epoch numbers, they will change every time we form a cluster. So we start up the cluster, and we form the cluster, we will increase the epoch number. The sequence number now is used to track the changes, all the changes on our um, clusters. Every time you make a configuration change, we change the sequence number and we replicate it to, uh, to our, our, uh, our clusters. And uh, since this is a DR session, what it can be used now is we can use it to verify if an authoritative restore of the cluster database happened. Now, um, where well, this might be important, when I do the disaster recovery planning with customers, obviously not all of you are using Windows Server Backup or, uh, or Data Protection Manager, right? So some of you might use uh, some, some partner backup tools, and you want to use them because you invested lots of money in it. So that's what you want to use to protect your, uh, protect your clusters as well. Now, a couple of times, uh, I then ask customers, hey, all right, do you know if the, uh, if the tool you're using supports failover clustering 2008 and R2 and 2012. And sometimes the answer is then, well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I know that it talks to the backup API, but I'm not quite sure if it, if, if it supports it. And um, so then we usually test um, the backup once, and we restore the cluster, and we do an authoritative restore. We simulate a failure in a test environment. And sometimes the backup guy then, the backup admin, restores a cluster node, authoritative restore, to uh, restore deleted objects, and nothing happens. And then we need to check. We need to ch somewhere uh, identify if an authoritative restore happened or not, because we didn't get back any deleted objects. We want to see if the backup tool really, really um, talked to, uh, to the node and, and update the cluster. And now this is the, um, the part where the Paxos tag changes its complete format. And uh, you can see now in here in this scenario is 33267. So you see um, three numbers separated by a colon. Now, we talked about when it updates, when, we, when it updates about the sequence and the epoch. 
And now when it changes, um, we change now to a date time format, which looks really different. You can see at the bottom of the, of the slide. So in this case, it's from uh, May 25th when I set up the slides and did the demos. Um, we changed the whole format. The second part is where it changes. When you start a cluster in a disaster scenario with the force quorum switch. Perhaps some of you, has, you have used the force quorum switch. In 2008, we went um, and uh, uh, changed to a voting model for our quorum. Right? If you don't have the majority of votes online in your cluster, let's say only a single node survived, and you don't have the majority, you could run the force quorum switch to still um, start the cluster service. And that also changes the Paxos tag. Now, this is really a great part where you can check uh, what's going on in your cluster. So those are a couple of things. Now, moving on. So this was uh, from, from your response uh, fairly new to you with the Paxos tag, but really important to know for disaster recovery purposes. Now, a few different scenarios. I already mentioned a couple of the buzzwords, authoritative restore, non-authoritative restore. We have different mechanisms. We have that in Active Directory, we have it in clustering. Now, the authoritative restore, what I mean by that is someone deletes your cluster configuration, so um, goes into failover cluster manager, right-clicks all your resources, runs the script, deletes all your resources, creates PowerShell script, deletes everything, could be on purpose. Um, you know, we had a couple of security compromises, unfortunately, disgruntled employees uh, over in the Australian government. It was all in the news, so that's why I can actually share that with you. And uh, so that can happen, right? Security compromise, uh, it's, it's one of the big things you guys need to prepare against. And, um, or it could be just a mistake, right? Mistakes happen, you accidentally delete it. Hopefully you don't ex accidentally delete your Hyper-V uh, cluster configuration containing 4,000 virtual machines, right? So hopefully that doesn't happen. The other part now is the thing that it really depends uh, what you want to do. So there are different options for the non-authoritative restore. Let's say you have a cluster, let's keep it very simple. Let's say you have a four node cluster, one of the node fails, you've got three left, your users are happy, all your workload is fine, CPU utilization on the host is fine, and, but you've got this failed node sitting around. Now you can decide. You can use either what I'm doing in a demo in a second. You can start recovering a cluster node using the bare metal feature of Windows Server Backup, of DPM, using your own third party, or uh, third party backup software. Or you can simply evict the node reinstall all the software, reinstall the OS, and rejoin it to the cluster. So both options are obviously uh, completely valid. So it depends what you need to do. Sometimes bare metal recovery is really simple, really easy, because it installs everything and all the configuration back. And uh, let's uh, hope my uh, virtual machines are back up and running now. Two demos. First of all, we have a look at uh, System Center, uh, DPM 2012, Data Protection Manager. SP1, of course, since I'm using 2012 servers. We have a, a very brief look how the bare metal recovery feature works in there. It's a bit of the extended one. So they use the same Windows recovery console to recover the bare metal recovery. But obviously, DPM has the advantages of uh, um, uh, storing your backups to disk, to tape, and all these kind of things. And uh, the second demo that we'll do as well yeah, the second demo will be an authoritative restore where I'm using the inbuilt Windows backup to recover um, deleted resources. So let's get into it, and hopefully my, uh, my VMs are running. Okay. Of critical, not a good sign, right? <clears throat> All right. So let me quickly, quickly while while the machines are starting, uh, explain uh, explain what we have in here. Start failed. So I created two cluster environments, two 2012 clusters, and one DPM 2012 server in here. This whole thing, since I'm, I'm running VM a bit, uh, you know, only have a few resources available. Um, running controls at EC2 in this case, that's my only server 2012 to main controller. And 
and I'm running two, uh, two clusters in here. There you go. Starting succeeded. Just took a while. So the DPM has a box that's sitting also on an um, external disk. So um, what we'll start with is, is the authoritative restore, since my DPM server is starting up. So we'll do the second demo first. Let's flip it around a bit. Okay. Cluster node one. Of course, it was unplanned. All right. So we've got our old school failover cluster manager. Few changes in 2012, not so much. And this is very important. So most of the things in here that I'm, I'm showing you, they work very, very similar in 2008 and R2. So while some of the names have changed, if you start creating, and you might go back because you don't have a perfect DR plan yet, and you go back to work, and you start creating your recovery plans, um, start writing them in 2008, start writing them in 2008 R2, you might only need to update a couple of, uh, a couple of steps in, um, in 2012. So, in this case, I kept it very, very simple. So, what we have, to increase it a bit, I've got two cluster nodes, MSC1, MSCS2, and I've got a file cluster. Who's running file clusters in here? Yeah, so a few. So, I created two file clusters. This one is an old school file cluster, and the other one is a scale out file cluster, using a bit more complexity, at least, with a cluster shared volume. Um, Windows Server Backup in 2008 and R2 doesn't yet. Um, support backing up cluster shared volumes that support that came down the road in 2012. So if you have a 2008 and a 2 cluster, you need to be aware of that one. So what I will do in the, in the authoritative restore, I simply go to the roles in this case, and I create a disaster. I right click, I remove, hit yes. Pending, everything is gone. Everything is gone everywhere. There was one pop-up saying, do you really want to delete it? Yes, gone. That could be, you know, running a script, 100 virtual machines. So this is what I said where the multi-site cluster does not necessarily help. Now, how do we, how do we get it back? Um, we've got a little tool, our command line tool for Windows Server Backup called WB Admin. Um, has all sorts of different options that you can see. Uh, WB admin get versions. Now what this does, it uh, checks all the latest backups that I've taken. Should come up with a few. I had, um, started a few. Uh, started a few backups. So let's have a quick look. Um, you can see a backup time, 19th of May. That's when I started thinking about TechEd in the US a bit and uh, you know, started building my test environment. Then May 28th, I made a couple of configuration changes. And uh, then, I think that was last night, right? Or two days ago. Um, I decided to uh, change a couple of configuration issue, uh, uh, items and um, took another backup. Now, there are a couple of other important uh, parts. Not only the backup time, Backup target um, is there. Now, the backup target doesn't necessarily tell you that the backup is accessible. Right? It could be a remote file share or anything like that. In this case, it's a locally attached uh, a backup disk that I'm running. Um, and we have a very important version identifier in here. The version identifier gives you uh, also a timestamp, but it also gives us the uh, ability to access the correct backup. And very important, it tells us what we can recover. Volume, files, applications, that's great. That's what we want to do. We want to recover a cluster and application. Bare metal recovery and system state. Now, the minimum that I would need in this case to recover my cluster database is the uh, system state recovery. Now, the other thing that I want to check now is um, do I have the cluster database in there? So the one thing that's important on a cluster, if we go to C, Windows, uh, cluster, you see the cluster B. Now the cluster B, in this case, you can see it's tiny in my case. It's 256K. It's a little configuration file where we store all the cluster configuration, apart from the registry and other locations. But this is important. And this is the file that we want to recover in this case. So we'll run um, get items. 
version, and now we specify which, um, which version we want to run. Uh, version. So I'm really bad at typing. Just uh, hope that I don't make too many mistakes. Um, version identifier. That's what we need. We copy, copy that one. Column. Didn't add that. There you go. Paste. Enter. Get items. Get items. Sorry. Thank you. It's I'm 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 also partly deaf it seems. Thank you. Thanks for the typo. Um, all right. Now, what we can see in here. Uh, is what we, what we really need, our cluster application, our cluster database. That's what we want to recover. And now we want to do the authoritative restore. WB admin, start typing. WB admin, start recovery. Let's hope I make uh, less, less uh, typos now. Version, not versions. Uh, now we give it the item type. Item type app and items cluster. There you go. Glad that worked. Uh, testing the demos. I made heaps of typing mistakes in here. Uh, now we get a couple of messages. And uh, it tells us, all right, you want to, you've chosen to recover the application cluster. The following components will be recovered. Our cluster database. Great. That's what we want to do. Warning. This operation will perform an authoritative restore of your cluster. After recovering the cluster database, the cluster service will be stopped and then started. This might take a few minutes. Do you want to continue with the authoritative recovery of the cluster? Yes. We are still missing all our objects, so we um, say yes. And now my backup disk did not come back online. Which is a shame. So where I stored it was um, in disk management. So I love it, right? You, you test those a couple of things, and you test it even half an hour before, uh, and it still fails. There's my hard disk, EVMs. And there's my disk. All right, since this is external, we uh, give this guy a little reboot, and we have a look at the other cluster in the meantime. Okay. Reboot to attach the proper disk. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. Now, um, before we, we uh, recover that, let's have a look at the complete bare metal recovery. Let's hope that works straight away. Look, my machine didn't survive everything. Now, looking at DPM, who's used Data Protection Manager in here in 2012? So quite a few. Um, that's great. So uh, we'll keep it very brief in here. There are a couple of things you need to, need to uh, be aware of. Of course, that was also gone.
Now, what I installed, uh, DPM, as most of the backup products, is sort of agent-based, right? So you install an agent on your cluster nodes, and it protects it. You can schedule backups and all these different things. So in this case, I installed the agents on my second cluster, on node 1. It's protecting the cluster, and I uh, chose different options. I say I want to have the bare metal option. I want to have a system state backup. Now, the, the advantage of DPM um, comparing it to the inbuilt Windows Server backup feature, which also supports bare metal recovery, by the way, um, is obviously that you can store your backups on disk to type, have all the retention policies, and all these kind of things. So if I now want to go ahead and re recover a uh, cluster, now in this case, MSCS1, I uh, have a look at a couple of different backup files, and I'll say recover. What we do in here now is we access the DPM database, we access the DPM backups, and we will restore it to a network folder in this case. So it doesn't talk to the network agent, and it doesn't talk to the DPM agent straight away and, and, and restores the cluster. What we'll do is we um, copy it to, uh, to a destination. So in this case, I created a few shares, and uh, this is the one that we'll uh, access in a second. There you go, it took a while. And uh, you can see there are a couple of shares in here, and there is a restore share that you can use. You can use uh, share any way you want. You hit next. Uh, you can uh, apply different security settings, and then you now say, all right, I want to uh, recover the bare metal recovery of this server to a specific store. Now, this is only the first part of the story of your bare metal recovery. Let's say you now lost the whole cluster. Now I'm, uh, I'm creating another scenario, this time on purpose, uh, and not, uh, not an accidentally one like before. And uh, this is my MSCS2. So let's have a quick look at what's running on MSCS2. Another 2012 cluster. And this one, as I said, is running a cluster shed volume with a scale-out file server. Pretty cool new feature that we came out with in 2012. And um, in this case, let's assume you don't have a stretch cluster, no geo cluster, multi-site cluster, lots of different names for that. It's only a single one. It's a single cluster, two nodes, and something really bad happens. Um, again, uh, unfortunately, there were a few, few really bad floods up in Queensland uh, uh, the other year in Australia. Then there were lots and lots of flooded data centers. We had to assist customers with lots of uh, services that needed to be restored and all these things. So you can see, again, it's a simple uh, scale-out file server resource in this case. Now let's uh, create a disaster and uh, turn it off. I'm not even shutting it down. I'll simply turn it off. And it's gone. Right, now your users can't access the files anymore. Maybe not their virtual machines. Their SQL data is down. Now, what I did is, I, since this is virtual, it's fairly simple. I love, I love uh, um, doing DR in virtual environments simply for the fact that when you use uh, bare metal recovery uh, even and uh, Windows Server Backup, we only support restoring to similar hardware. Not similar, the same hardware actually needs to be, right? Finding the same servers, even the same blades, um, when, you, when you brought them together with the same hardware configuration, everything, a couple of years down the road, it's almost impossible. So it's great if you run from, from one Hyper-V version to the same Hyper-V version, it's great to recover. So what I've done is, uh, let's have a quick look. I created a, a new virtual machine. Um, I uh, created a new hard drive. The restore VHDX, you can have a look at uh, its... Uh, it's a plain, it's a dynamically expanding disk that I've used. Restore node. Right, so you can see the size. Oh, you can see the size. Uh, 4K. Nothing on there yet. And uh, I've also attached the 2012 ISO. That's all we need. We need some sort of boot media, right? It could be WinPE, it could be ISO image, something like that. So we'll boot from the ISO image now, and the idea is that we access, we start from the DVD, and we access, we go into the recovery console, and we access the 
backup that will restore to this file share remotely. Now you could backup, there you go, uh, increase that a bit. Um, now you could back up, back up uh, you could have the backup on a locally attached disk, you could have the backup on a file share, doesn't really matter, both works. We select our language settings, we can leave it in the English and US. And now, instead of saying install now, we'll go and add repair your computer. So we hit that one. And now we end up in the new fancy uh, 2012 recovery console. Maybe some of you have seen that, so it got, got uh, redesigned in 2012. Troubleshoot, so no longer old sort of black DOS, DOS windows. And what we want to do now is a system image recovery. First of all, what we do, it's looking locally at a disk it's looking locally at a disk and if a backup is available. There is no local disk since mine is stored on the DPM server in this scenario. I hit cancel and I want to add a file share. I'll say advanced, two options, uh, search for image on the network and install a driver. Now install a driver is needed when your network card is not supported. I've done lots of planning with customers where the NIC wasn't supported and they had to uh, uh, um, add a couple of drivers or the, the, the hard disk, the SAN wasn't supported, had a couple. Uh, the other important part in here is now we want to connect to the network, yes. Now if you're not running DHCP on the same network, we're not getting any IP address in this case. So you need to manually configure an IP address, which also adds a bit of complexity. In this case, I'm running DHCP on my domain controller, which I hope after all these weird shutdowns is still working. Um, so I'm trying to access the file share on DPN. Um, uh, restore. Okay, just double check in. I should have used an easier name. Uh, Contoso Administrator and my password. Now we're trying to access the um, backup and gladly that worked. We select the backup, could be different ones, right? Could be different ones. However, in this case, when you see that the uh, backup that you wanted to have does not come up and Windows Recovery Console simply can't access the backup, it could have a reason. Reason could be that uh, when we restored it on DPM and we go to our restore folder in this case, this is my restore folder, you can see the DPM. You can see where DPM restored the directory, DPM. You can see another one. DPM recovered, and within the second folder, now finally we find the Windows image backup. Now for the Windows recovery to find this Windows image backup directory, it needs to be on the root of the file system or on the root of the folder, otherwise it just tells you, hey, I can't find any backup even if it's there. It's a very, very common thing. So uh, once you recover it from DPM, what you need to simply do is you need to move it out and you uh, copy it to the root of the share, to the root of the disk, wherever you want to access it, right? So it's, the, it's, it's a very important step. And we'll simply hit next, and we recover it, hit next. And in this case, I'm, I've only got a, um, got a single disk. If you have lots of attached disks, you might want to exclude a few. Otherwise, you start repartitioning and formatting things now. Uh, that's a bad idea. Um, next, and we finish it. All disks gives us a message. All disks to be restored will be formatted and replaced with a layout and data in the system image. Are you sure you want to continue? Yes, we are. And now it's preparing. We are, don't worry, we're not looking at the progress bar now for a five, you know, five minutes. It takes about five, six minutes, so I'll start looking at some other demos. What is happening now is we re-image the, um, uh, the new disk and we simply start up our cluster with a single node configuration in this case. So it's starting to restoring disk, starting to restore. Now it started restoring disk C. So we'll come back to that in a, in a second. While this is going, and uh, we have a look at we have a look at what my uh, authoritative resource is doing. If I've got my backup back, there you go. That's my backup volume. So let's give it another go. That was a really great example of um, where WB admin uh, get. Get. 
where WB admin get version tells you, hey, your backup is located at a specific location, but it's not even accessible, right? So um, it could be a file share. You need, really need to make sure that it's there. So we'll have a look again. All right, WB admin uh, get versions. We've got the same version number. So this time we made sure that we have a fixed disk labeled E, correct? And we'll copy and paste again the version identifier and try to do it again. WB admin start recovery. And we hit version. Paste the version number. That's important. Item type. Item type. Again, it's going to be an app. And items cluster. Again, the question is, do you want to do an authoritative restore? Yes, all our stuff is still, uh, still deleted. So we hit yes. And now, gladly, because we can access uh, the disk, it now starts working a bit. So we'll leave it uh, for a couple of seconds. Uh, what it will do now, we'll talk to the, um, uh, uh, to the backup, and we'll have a look at the cluster database that we looked at in C Windows Cluster. It now prepares the component cluster database for recovery. And there you go. It uh, updated it already. Recovering cluster, the files for the component database, recovering the cluster uh, database. And the thing that's very important in this case, we don't need to reboot. We don't need to restore a whole system state backup. So you don't need to uh, restore uh, 5 gigabytes, 10 gigabytes of data. We're only recovering the file. We do an authoritative restore. This is a massive, massive uh, advantage, I think, that we have um, um, compared to some other third-party applications that also support authoritative restore of cluster, of course, but what they need to do is uh, a complete and full system state recovery that takes a while. So you need to reboot the box, you restore the system state, and all these kind of things. So um, this is now working in the background uh, a bit, and it will recover the, um, the deleted file cluster. It also stops the cluster service on all the cluster nodes, and what also happens now in a second, we'll see it, uh, we'll go back to the registry. And remember when we talked about the Paxos tag a while ago? This is now where we change the Paxos tag and, um, and uh, change the format into this date time format. And this is where you can now say, hey, yeah, something talked to my, to my database. Um, so it takes a moment. Well, let's have a look in the registry. Let's see how far um, where we are. There you go. So part of the stuff, even though the command prompt is telling you, hey, I'm still going, things happen in the background. So you can see the Paxos tag has now changed to new date time format. And you can say, yes, something talked to the backup API, something did the authoritative restore. That's a good indicator if you're using third-party applications to backup and restore your clusters. Have a look at the Paxos tag and see if it actually changes it. Sometimes uh, people just tick a tick box, auth restore, or you run a script, auth restore, and nothing happens. The Paxos tag is the old, old version. Uh, there you go. Now, I talked long enough and to, for it to actually continue and to finish. So we got a couple of uh, options in here. We have a nice log file that you can look at if something is failing. Uh, have a look at the log file. And now it gives us a bit of information down here. So it tells us the component cluster database was successfully recovered. To complete the restoration of the cluster associated with this node, you must do the following. Start the cluster service on this node. Now, this is the important part, right? If you start the cluster service first on a node that you didn't recover, it will just start forming the cluster, and you lose all your changes again. It's very similar to, uh, to uh, Active Directory in that, that perspective. It's when you restore a backup and you forget to uh, set the auth restore flag, for example. And then you start the cluster service uh, uh, on the nodes uh, identified in the restore cluster. And now it gives you a nice, uh, gives, <laughs> gives you a nice hint, which is uh, kind of nice. If you don't know the cluster nodes you have, it gives you the PowerShell command and, hey, run this. And now you know, you know do you have 30, 30 nodes, 60 nodes, and all that kind of stuff. So you can script it if you want. What we'll do is we'll open failover cluster manager now. And if everything worked after a couple of hiccups, um, we have nodes, two, one up and one down. That's sort of expected, right? The first cluster is up, uh, and the second one not yet. And uh, it also has our file cluster back up and running, saying, hey, 
I just recreated, not, sorry, not recreated, restored from backup. This could be 500 virtual machines in Hyper-V. And this is a, a common response that I sometimes, unfortunately, get from uh, customers. And that's the reason why I'm quite passionate about this session is I want to show how easy it is and how quick it can be to recover these things. Because lots of the time, the response in the DR plan is, what do you do when you lose 200, 500, 1,000 virtual machines in Hyper-V? Well, we just take our built document and recreate everything. And um, so that obviously takes a lot longer, probably even if you script it, than uh, doing the authoritative restore. Uh, the last bit that I need to do to um, have my uh, two node cluster back up and running is I simply uh, start the cluster service and we're good to go again. All right. Good. So, two big restores, authoritative restore, and non-authoritative restore. Now moving into the, into the next bit. I have to switch my, uh, my slides on. Uh, moving into the next bit, we have a look at the cluster name object recovery. So there are a few, a few different uh, objects we have in Active Directory. The CNO, the VCO, got introduced in 2008. They haven't really changed in, in 2008 or to 2012, but we changed the way we, we, we communicate with the CNOs now. So when we have a look at what it is, CNO is sort of known as the common identity for a failover cluster. Stored in Active Directory, 2008 and R2, they, um, uh, well, even in 2012, per default they go into the computer's container, and after them you can move them into your own or you or wherever you want to place it. It's a good idea that you know, uh, you know uh, where they are. Uh, what the CNO does, uh, it now creates all the network name resources for any client access points that you might configure. So it's really important when you start configuring down the line, um, you want to use all the, you know, Kerberos authentication, all these things. So uh, the CNO would then uh, create client access points and it's also responsible for synchronizi uh, synchronizing uh, the domain passwords for the VCOs, the virtual computer objects that we create for a file cluster, for a Hyper-V, for SQL. So we have a look at those. There are two ways. Uh, to recover them. The CNO is like a two-step process, whereas the VCO, the virtual computer object, is a lot easier. Now let's go back and have a look at that as well. Now, first of all, we need to go into, uh, into Active Directory. Anyone in here managing Active Directory and clustering? Or, oh, yeah, a few of you. So, um, there are a couple of things you need to know in an Active Directory, or only a few hands. Uh, the important part is how we delete objects in Active Directory. What's happening when we delete an uh, object in Active Directory? Let's see if my uh, domain controller after the unexpected shutdown came back fine. And um, let's have a look. Let's increase that a bit. Anyone using already the Active Directory Admin Center in 2012, the new one? Oh, yeah, everyone's still using ADUs and computers? All right. So uh, when I prepared for the demo, I was always going, you know, also a bit old school in that ADUs and computers or, you know, PowerShell. I thought it might be a good opportunity to show ADEC. Uh, it's quite improved in Server 2012. Have a look uh, at what's possible. So in this case, it's not in the AD session, so very basic. Uh, Contoso.com, that's my domain. That's my computer's container. You see a couple of different objects in here. Um, you see a computer account for my DPM server. You see the computer accounts for my cluster nodes. And now what you also see is the uh, Tekka cluster one and Tekka cluster two. Those are the cluster name objects for the cluster. You create a cluster with a cluster name. In this case, I chose Tekka cluster one and two, and those are the objects we create. You also see other objects, uh, two, for the file service I created. One I called file cluster one, and the other one I called scale out FS. So those are virtual computer objects. Now, disaster recovery, right? So we're creating a disaster. First of all, what we do is now um, we delete Tekka cluster one. Gone. Now this is a problem at some point, not straight away. You will see the cluster is still working. We'll go back here, the cluster is still working. If we go to Tekka cluster, and uh, this is a bit uh, um, 
a few things that got improved or changed, maybe. Uh, let's call it changed in Server 2012, where you can now in the GUI even could, uh, could change cluster core resources. A couple of uh, customers I worked with in 2008 and now too, they say, well, how can I move around my quorum resource and all this kind of stuff? So what I just deleted was the cluster name in here, which is still running. Now, the one thing that's changed in 2012, I already said that we don't necessarily talk to a domain controller anymore. However, let's go in here and take it offline. Since lots of you are still running 2008 and R2, on a side note, what's happening if you're running 2008 and R2 and you now try to restart the cluster name object, it will fail. It will not work. In 2012, um, since we don't necessarily have a domain controller anymore, we are online pending online pending, and we're online. Big change between 2008 R2 and 2012. However, we get a very similar event because even though it is online, hopefully everyone's using active monitoring tool, right? Um, system center perhaps, that then identifies and talks to the cluster node saying, hey, give me all the critical events. And what you get now is the critical event uh, 12, 1207. Let's increase it a bit. Which says the computer object associated with the cluster network name, cluster name, could not be updated in domain controls.com um, due to a failure. There is no such object on the server, which should give you a hint to look on the server. It could also mean you can't connect to DC or something like that. So in this case, it's missing. Obviously, you need to do something about it. The change, again, in 2012 is the resource starts, but there is a problem, of course, down the road. 2008 2 2008, it doesn't even start. Uh, now we want to remove it. Uh, sorry, now we want to restore it, not remove it. And for this to understand, you need to know a bit about how Active Directory um, uh, deletions work. When we delete the object, in this case, I'm not using an AD Recycle Bin to make it a bit more complex. Who's using AD Recycle Bin in their environments? It's great if, for a few of you guys, because all you need to do if you use ADAC, you go to the uh, 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 ADAC, you hit right-click, restore, and you're, you're golden. Everything works. Um, you could also use PowerShell, AD Object Restore, of course. In this case, I made it a bit more complex, since most of you, as you know, very common, uh, are not running the AD Recycle Bin yet, because you've still got this old 2003 or 2008 domain controller sitting around, and you can't go to the forest function level 2008 or 2, which is a prerequisite for AD Recycle Bin. Um, what we do now is when we delete an object, we get rid of most of the attributes. We, so we would, if it was a user account, we would strip away memberships, group memberships, and all that kind of stuff, attributes like email address. In this case, it's a computer account. It's a cluster name object. So we get rid of machine account passwords and all that stuff. We keep the SID, though. And we then move it into the deleted objects container. And we keep it in there for the period of tombstone lifetime where the default settings are either 60 days or 180 days, depending on the OS you're running. Now, since a cluster is a high available system, I can't see it happening that you guys, that someone loses a cluster name object and after 61 days or 181 days, it says, oh, I really need to restore that one, right? So you, 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 probably, you probably discover a lot earlier. So in this case, uh, uh, I'm using old school tool. Uh, some of you might know it. Uh, it's been around for ages, AD Restore. And what AD Restore does, it's... Uh, um, yeah, no, it, it, it would work, yeah. Um, however... Yeah, no, so I, I would restore it, would restore it first, though. Um, let's have a look. Um, AD... AD Restore. So to access AD Restore, obviously, I was on the, on the wrong machine. Um, Control ZDC uh, 2. Now, old school tool has been around for ages. And all it does, it reanimates the object. So it gets the object back with the one thing that we care about is the SID and puts it back to the last known parent. So I've restored a few um, already. So if you simply run a restore, and uh, you can see file cluster one, file cluster one, TechEd cluster uh, in this case. Um, TechEd cluster one is the one that we want to restore. Uh, AD restore has a very easy syntax, dash, dash R, 
and you don't even need to have a, a, a complicated LDAP filter or anything like that. You call it TechEd. And now it asks you, hey, you want to restore it? You want to restore your Tekka cluster with a squid and uh, the last known parent. The last known parent has to exist. Otherwise, the restore or the reanimation doesn't work. Now, in this case, it's easy. Uh, computers container usually exists everywhere, right? But if your cluster name object was moved into another OU and someone deleted the whole OU, you need to recreate or we need to restore the OU first. Sorry? You can just recreate the OU. Yeah, so the question was, if, if you can just recreate it, yes. Um, because the important part in this case is the SID of the object, not so much uh, anything in the OU. We restored it, or reanimated it, that, uh, that worked. We'll go back into AD, we refresh, and now what you can see, it comes up as a disabled object. So the last bit that we need to do is we need to enable it. And the one thing now that's missing, and this is where the uh, cluster admin tool now comes back in. Now we restored it, we re-enabled it, but all the you know, other configuration passwords and things are missing. So we need to do one additional step on our cluster in this case. And we need to uh, do that in here. We go to the cluster admin console, for example. So we take it offline. And uh, now this is new since 2008. If you go right-click, more actions, you now have a repair button, which does the work for you. 2003, it was a huge pain to, to, to restore those, and this does the work for you. It's online pending, it's repairing the object, updating everything for you. Now, the important part is, I ran into this issue during disaster recovery testing with the customer the other week, is when you do lots of testing, uh, you might have 10, 20 different, different, of those, different objects. The important part is now that you... Um, catch the right object. So, control the DC2. So you need to check out the, um, the object GUID as well. You can see all the deleted objects, will, they will have different GUIDs, and then you simply match it. Um, anyways, so in this case, we can go back to our cluster, go here, and uh, could have a look at the critical events. And this is the old one at uh, some time ago, and there is no new one. So keep in mind, 2008, 2008 2 before you reanimate the object, the cluster name object doesn't even come back online. 2012 comes back online, but you still need to do some, some stuff under the hood. Now, I, I said we've got two different types of objects. Let's continue. We've got about... 17 minutes left, um, and have a look at the virtual cluster, sorry, virtual computer object. That's the other one that we need to have. And as I said, this is a bit easier since we can simply recreate it. Now let's say uh, someone is going in here and deletes the object. File cluster one, again, problem, right? Hopefully you've got a sort of response plan what to do. And what you can do now is you simply uh, go to your MSCS. That's the guy I just, uh, I just deleted. So you can see it's still running. Take it offline. And the same stuff happens now. More actions, repair. It does the online repair for you. Starts online, online, online. And uh, when we go back to our Control ZDC1, sorry, Control ZDC2, and we refresh it, you can see that file cluster is back online. So this is a lot easier for the virtual computer object to, uh, to recreate than the um, sort of common, common identity, the CNO. So again, very easy. Took a few minutes, and we're back in business with uh, everything in AD, uh, in the AD world. <clears throat> Obviously, you need domain admin rights to do these recovery options, right? So every cluster admin who sits in here who doesn't have domain admin rights, you need to get your AD people engaged as well. All right, replacing a shared disk. 
uh, got the question from a customer a while ago, so uh, how often does that happen? How often do we need to replace a shared disk or a failed disk? And some customers say, you know, you wouldn't have guessed it. We have RAID mirrors, and it's, it's you know, duplicated everywhere, and still something, something happens where we need to do that. So uh, there are a couple of options. In uh, 2008, 2008, 2 we came up with maintenance mode, um, which suspends all, all health checks and makes it available uh, for, for all sorts of check disks, defrag, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe you're, ha you're lucky, and your check disk saves your, saves your disk, and everything is working again. Uh, however, when you want to completely recreate it, you attach a new disk on your SAN. In this case, I'm using iSCSI targets on my domain controller. It also works as my iSCSI host. You online and initialize the disk in disk management. It's fairly simple. You use uh, MBR, GPT, no dynamic disk support, right? You create a new volume, and then you can uh, uh, choose. Format either as FAT32, NTFS, ReFS. Anyone using ReFS yet? No, it's, ah, there, there you go. Single, single hand. Great stuff. So depending on the requirements, what you have, do you have a quorum? Is it just a normal shared disk? You need to uh, figure out which, uh, which you want to use. And then again, we have a demo of that in a second. I've got a demo for you. Uh, more actions, a little repair wizard. So everyone who's recovered a disk and a shared disk replaced it in 2003, massive pain. You had to use all these old tools, dump CFG, cluster recovery XE which replaces disk signatures and all these things you have to know. Uh, in this case, it's very, very simple. Sorry, and uh, it's uh, almost the same, 2008, 2008, 2012. So uh, quite simple. In this case, what I'm doing, and that's the big job you guys have, let's say a shared disk, re um, shared disk resource failed that has 40 terabytes of data on it. So while the recovery of the initial disk in, in a second will work really, really fast, the big job then is to recover all the data back onto the disk, and that might take hours, days, minutes, depending on how much it is. Now let's quickly walk through, uh, through the demo. That's a, uh, another quick one, if everything's working. So let me quickly explain my setup. Controls at EC2 um, also runs now uh, iSCSI target server. In case you used it in 2012, it's, it's a lot easier to set up. Um, in 2008, you could manually download iSCSI software target for about, I think, a couple of years now, I guess. And in 2012, finally, it's built in. You simply install it. And it's very, very simple to attach it. So what I created, two iSCSI targets, one for my cluster one, one for my cluster two. And uh, I created a bunch of disks. Now, in this case, what we'll do is we cause another failure. So we have the iSCSI targets down here. Take out cluster one. And we have a couple of disks up here. Let's see. So I'm using take out cluster one, and I simply disable the disk. And also what I do in a second, this, this is the, uh, the disaster. Um, while we're at it, I create a replacement disk as well. New iSCSI virtual disk. Uh, control ZDC2, that's where I want to create it. And uh, tech at replace. We can give it a name, a description if we want. Now, all my disks are very small 200 megs, 250. Needs to be at least the same size. I can decide which iSCSI target I want it to attach to. So in this case, I'm running it, of course, against my Tekka cluster one, right? Tekka cluster one, next. Gives me an overview of what's going on. I create it, and it now runs a couple of tasks in the background. It's creating the disk, attaching it. And what now happens is I go back into uh, my uh, MSCS1, into disk management, storage first. Looks like I uh, failed a disk that uh, wasn't even assigned. So we create a manual disaster in this case. Let's uh, take it offline. That's our disaster. Big problem. Now we go into disk management. And when we attach, attach the disk in the iSCSI target, again, this has been massively redesigned between 2003 and 2008 is where we can simply have all the cluster nodes online and we attach the disk. So in here, what I have now is a new disk 
which is, you can see, all my old disks were sort of 199 megs. You can see this is the new one, 250 megs. But it's not online. It's not initialized. It's not doesn't have a petition or anything like that. So we bring it online. We initialize it, MBR, and uh, we create a new simple volume. Next, NTFS. All right. Now, uh, it's available, but it's not managed yet by the cluster. We close this one, cancel. And now the important part is, um, every time you create a resource in the cluster, first thing you do is you take the disk and you add it to storage, right? So let me show you this, because then you can't use it to, re to, uh, to repair a disk anymore. So common task, you add the disk. I've got two disks. That's great. Uh, my 200 Mac, Mac disk. A uh, 200 meg disk and a 250 meg disk. Say, OK, I want to add both to the cluster. I'm adding it. They are online. That's great. But now what I want to do is I want to repair the disk. And again, there is a wizard. We hit right click, more actions, repair. And it now comes back online and says, nah, no suitable disk for your cluster disk uh, for your cluster was found. And that's the reason because those two disks that are attached, they are now already managed by the cluster. We can't use them to repair any disk anymore. So, so very common, common uh, mistake sort of that I see. So you remove one. And what we have now is uh, one that's not managed by the cluster. More actions, repair. And now we can see the disk comes up. Capacity, uh, signatures, and we can simply tick it. Hit OK. It's updating all the physical disk resources. and. Uh, the last bit is we need to bring it online. And it's back online. Obviously, this is the configuration, right? So if you now had uh, SQL databases on the file, if you had virtual machines on a clustered volume, if you had uh, lots of files on there, you need to restore the data on top. This gives you, as I said, our focus on the platform. So it gives you the platform back. All right. There's another easy one. Now, quorum recovery. Uh, very quick. In this case, between 2003 and 2008, R2, we moved to a couple of different uh, quorum models. We added a few. We added a voting model where you need to, uh, for example, a node majority. You need to have the majority of nodes online for the cluster to be able to form. And the important part, since we're talking about DR in this case, is we need to have a look at um, what data do we need to recover. In a node and disk majority, where you have votes for every single node that you have, and your disk, your quorum disk, also has a vote, we store um, a copy of the registry hive of our cluster configuration on the disk. When you have a node and file share majority, we don't st store any registry keys. We don't store a, a class DB on there. We do store a log file that contains Paxos tag information. So we have a look at that and uh, what we do to recover. These are the easiest ones. And since we uh, already recovered, uh, since we already recovered, I had the wrong button. Since we already recovered a disk, you can imagine that replacing the quorum is pretty much the same. Uh, we want to focus in this demo quickly on uh, the file share witness. So to change the quorum settings, you can see I've got a node and file share majority. In this case, it's pointing again to my DPM server. That's where my file share is sitting. Nice best practice is to have a high available file share. Maybe you've got a second cluster around where you add this file share to, to have it high available so it doesn't fail as quickly. However, since uh, file share witness is used mainly in, in geo cluster and stretch cluster um, uh, configurations, if you have all your, uh, all your cluster nodes online and the file share witness is just a tiebreaker, it's not necessarily a disaster straight away in the next five minutes, in the next 10 days. Uh, but it should be, of course, replaced fairly quickly. So we'll have a quick look at how that works. So we can go right-click, More Actions, Configure Cluster Quorum Settings. In case you haven't seen it in 2012, it's a bit of a different thing. Um, first of all, we can say uh, Typical Settings. Um, and we try to choose it for you. So ideally, in this case, would be because I've got a shared disk, I've got cluster nodes, it would tell me, hey, OK, perfect scenario for you is you go with node and disk majority. Um, <clears throat> I'll uh, trump in and say, no, I, uh, I want to change that. I want to change it, and I want to change it to a file share 
witness. It is already a file share witness, but I now want to make changes. So let's say my DPM server is not available anymore or my file share is not available anymore. All you need to do, all you need to do is you simply point it to a new file share. So you create the file share, uh, sorry, you create a file share on any server you want and you give the cluster name object, the CNO, write to that file share. So you don't need to give writes to every single node. You need to give writes to the cluster name object. That's enough. So we have a look at browse, DPM. And uh, so the old one was file, uh, file share witness old, and this is the file share witness, witness new. Uh, plain and simple, right? Hit OK. Next. And now it's giving us a little bit of information. Your cluster configuration will be changed to this configuration. Make sure that everything's available. And we hit, uh, hit next. Gives us an option. You can even have a look and a bit of a report. And now we're using the new file share witness. And if we look at the, if we have a look at the contents, file share witness new contains a new file. If you look at the timestamp, which is a bit of a weird time zone, but it's 9.26 a.m. Uh, on that box, and uh, 9.26 a.m., that's where I created the file share, file share witness, which contains the Paxos log file. And uh, log file, so you can see the log file in here. Fairly simple, fairly simple to recover. Um, all these are little examples of what can go wrong and it will take you quite a bit of time to identify how to fix these things if they're not documented. So this took about uh, an hour now, I think, going through all these different uh, smaller, smaller scenarios. And uh, hopefully the takeaway is that if you haven't, uh, haven't, haven't prepared and haven't documented all these disasters, and in this case it was a two-node cluster running file, but you could have 64 nodes running Hyper-V or that kind of thing. So hopefully, because the, 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 the process is the same, you go back and uh, write and uh, grade the R plan. Now, in case there are any Premier customers around, one thing I'm really passionate about, since I'm working for our Premier support as a PFE, uh, we've got an op offering that we uh, um, call the Cluster Server Recovery Execution Service. This is, uh, takes four days, where we come on set and help you guys out and test all these different configurations and different disaster scenarios with your, um, with your environment. Right, so it's, uh, it's a great thing to do. I added a few other links uh, about uh, System Center Config Manager and the DPM stuff and large scale backup if you have large, large VMs as well. With that, um, thanks a lot for coming. Um, we're done. We've got two minutes for questions if anyone's got a question. Other than that, you can find me later and after the session at the Tech Expo Server and Tools booth. So you can find me and um, we can have a chat. Thanks a lot.